My name is Georgi Kasyanov. I am head of Department of Contemporary History and Politics in the Institute of the History of Ukraine, uh, National Academy of Sciences. I am historian and I am a co-editor and co-author of uh, the book, which title is From the Ukraine to Ukraine. And then I don't remember what is the extension of the title. Contemporary History, 1991, 2021. Okay, great. So it's collective volume, so we have shared the uh, the title. Well, my name is Mikhailo Minakov, and I work for Canon Institute. And my res responsibility is to lead the uh, Canon Institute program on Ukraine. Uh, I am philosopher and uh, political scholar. And together with uh, Georgi and with Matt Rajansky, we were... Uh, the editors of the book, but it's a collective work. So in a way, the idea was to bring Ukrainian and Western scholars together and try to describe this recent experience of Ukrainians. Georgi has a wonderful book which was published around 2007, 2008, this contemporary history of Ukraine. But it st stopped like really after the Orange Revolution. And uh, now that there's a 30 years, it's an anniversary, and Ukrainian culture is very anniversary-minded culture. So it was good to write a book and make a summary of this experience. And Georgi, as a historian, was uh, critically important for, uh, as a guy in his guidance to, to the history, Georgi. Yeah, well, uh, to me personally, the uh, participation in this project was uh, important for uh, several reasons. Uh, first, uh, well, we have 30th anniversary of independence. So, uh, you know, all these kind of round dates are uh, kind of uh, pushed to reconsider, rethink, and uh, sometimes rewrite of the history. Uh, of, uh, well, we call this history, we call this contemporary history. I understand that it might might uh, sound as an oxymoron, but uh, generally, yes, it is history. When I ask people, what was, what, what did you do in 95 or 2000 or even 2005 or 10, people try to recall and then say, wow, it was so long ago. So to me, it was very important to, well, to recall. And uh, <laughs> I can use this title. Uh, it was a uh, reason for total recall uh, of the whole history for 30 years. And of course, so I was motivated personally and professionally. And the, the uh, proposal came from Misha, and uh, he was an author of the uh, idea. And uh, so I decided to join the team and uh, to become co-editor and co-author. I think it is really important that one of the main reasons behind that was to familiarize a Western public about contemporary Ukraine. We have now, well, a number of good works on the hist general history of Ukraine since uh, Scythians to uh, presidents, but uh, we, were, we have very few uh, general works on the history of Ukraine since 1991. So it is very, was very, it was one of the motives behind this and exactly the history which would be presented to Western reader. Well, I think uh, our approach was quite different from what you can see on the shelf, or what is available right now in European, Western European, or even Ukrainian uh, shelf of the his history books of Ukraine. First of all, our approach was not only political history. We wanted to look at Ukrainian experience. Politics is important, but it's not the only sphere where, where this experience was going on. So part of it, well, it's uh, Georgi and Serhii Kudela who wrote together the political chapter, the chapter on political development of Ukraine. But then the next one is how did uh, we invent the private sphere? 
So for late Soviet Ukrainians, uh, it was something unusual to have uh, entrepreneurship. What is the market? What means private property? It all had to be reinvented in a way in, in 1990s. So Timofey Milovanov and Ilona Solohub together wrote this chapter uh, on the development of this private sphere. Or that's uh, something that was very difficult to write, the, the chapter uh, dedicated to invention of richness and poverty. And instead of two authors, we have four authors who wrote this chapter, sociologists and historians. It's Yulia Yurchenko, Pablo Kutuyev, Maxim Yenin, and Hennady Karzhov. They really literally tried to reconstruct how did it happen that this social division and acceptance of poverty and acceptance of rich was uh, possible in, in a new society. Or the other chapter uh, is looking at Ukraine from the point of view of energy sector. Today, uh, well, already for, for a long time, but especially today, this energy issue, or uh, as some colleagues say, energy independence is a, a very important topic for Ukraine. And here, Margarita Balmaseda and uh, Andrian Prokip together described that part of experience. So, in a way, when we uh, offer um, our book, we offer very uh, diverse approach to what was happening with Ukrainians in recent 30 years. Uh, also, there's a wonderful chapter written by Diana Ducek and Marta Dechok about Ukrainian mass media. And again, how did it happen that U Ukraine is now a vibrant society with so many media media outlets and also competing medias, conflicts uh, between medias. And how did it happen that we have this rich landscape? And they, they reconstructed this path very well. I think it's one of the masterpieces in our book. Or Oksana Barshanova and Olena Martinuk together wrote a chapter dedicated to contemporary art. Again, Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian art, uh, contemporary art, is booming right now. This, uh, it's amazing what's happening in this sphere. But it, it was going from relatively closed community of uh, artists into something that is already not a national but a global phenomenon. And uh, that's a very interesting uh, chapter. Uh, and there's also two uh, chapters written by sociologists. One is about religious pluralism in Ukraine by Timofey Brik and Jose Casanova. And the other one uh, about national identities, how, what, how the identities were changing throughout these uh, uh, three decades. And this chapter is written by Oksana Mikheva and Oksana Shevel. The both chapters are marvelous. It's uh, also uh, research which, well, I, I think it's not on the market yet. It, it, it can exist only as separate articles somewhere, but in the constellation of chapters, we see the rich experience of Ukraine. And the final chapter, which was written by Matthew Rajansky and myself, it's a summary in a way of lucky and unlucky democratic experience of Ukraine. How did we try to become liberal democracy where we were failing, where we were progressing? And I think this chapter is also a good summary for these 30 years. Well, uh, well, Misha just highlighted the major, uh, the well, all chapters, which were the content of the uh, major chapters. Uh, generally, to me, um, it was a very interesting experience in terms of dealing with authors and their approaches. As Misha noted, there is a multiplicity of different uh, uh, approaches and understandings of the processes. Uh, and uh, sometimes they were not uh, congruent to the major line of the, the, our idea of the, of the project. And um, 
What is also interesting is that, uh, well, well, to me, once again, to me personally, it was a very interesting experience in terms of having a multiplicity of disciplines presented here in this volume. So uh, when I observed, uh, well, I expected when uh, we started this uh, project, I expected that it will be a set of articles, uh, uh, well, like collection of essays, but uh, as I see now, we have a kind of uh, underlying idea, uh, which is reflected on, <laughs> on the title, which is from the Ukraine to Ukraine. And it is about uh, turning Ukraine into a, uh, I would not say self-sufficient, but uh, at least a, in, a relatively independent actor in the world arena. So. Ukraine in I don't know how to translate it into English in Ukrainian it is from uh, being an uh, ob with object to subject uh, so probably uh, if I will say from Ukraine from being an a subject to to an object to, to an uh, agent mm -hmm. that might be a correct expression so Ukraine became an agent a uh, historical agent it's just say uh, actor uh, uh, from being non-actor so being uh, st starting to be an actor I understand all complexity of this and uh, uh, well internal and external problems and uh, well we understand the idea of uh, external rule in Ukraine now that uh, well people say that some some other forces dictate what we should do but generally at least we have a situation when Ukraine exists as a unit as an actor and if someone wants to rule Ukraine from outside at least he or she deals with Ukraine not with the Ukraine so, uh, and I think it's very important result of this uh, 30 years development, despite all these, well, real serious problems uh, within Ukraine and beyond Ukraine. So, uh, in this sense, this volume, uh, I think it uh, represents some kind of, uh, of course, not comprehensive, but some kind of picture which would uh, allow reader to uh, to understand and to compare and then to think about what happened what might happen and uh, at least to have an uh, image of uh, the ukrainians being in this contemporary world uh, i would stand for um, uh, this accumulation thesis that ukraine uh, was gaining the more and more and more subjectivity and so well the becoming an agent uh, from years to years because well we can we can say we can we can uh, uh, talk about say uh, let's say the parade of recognitions at the beginning of 90s since uh, the end of uh, 91 to 92 93 uh, but then, well, we have different uh, di different uh, indicators, for instance, not just recognition, but uh, uh, participation of Ukraine in uh, different international organizations and uh, alliances, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, at least, uh, well, since the uh, end of 90s, uh, Ukraine has been considered, was considered as a... Uh, uh, well, as a uh, self-sufficient actor, well, well, would it be talks about the NATO prospects or EU prospects or some other uh, uh, international structures? So people just were accustomed that Ukraine exists, that U Ukraine, despite all these uh, uh, problems, uh, well, obvious problems, is a state. And, uh, well, I think that one of the turning points was 2014 uh, when there was a open military aggression and uh, the war started. And uh, I know people that those who did not believe that Ukraine would be able to stand uh, because uh, army was uh, below zero, uh, the economics was uh, weak and, uh, well, some other problems, internal unity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, we see that uh, uh, we could we could speak about the weakness of state, and uh, you know that there was a idea that Ukraine is failed state, and it's still uh, well. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, different talks about Ukraine as a failed state, but 
when we talk about society, when we talk about the citizenries, uh, so we see that Ukraine exists. We have a generation of people who were born in Ukraine and now they are in their 30s. So I think that the most important uh, steps uh, in uh, this uh, process of transformation from the Ukraine to Ukraine is a, uh, a well, the uh, emergence of generation of those who were born in Ukraine and who believe that they are citizens of Ukraine and they do not have a question, does Ukraine exist or it does not? Uh, they just know it's a physical fact that Ukraine is there. And this is the probably the most important thing uh, in, um, in, uh, in this process. In 2005, my uh, second son, uh, uh, listening to Yushchenko, he was eight years uh, old this time, he uh, he heard the expression that Ukraine uh, is going to Europe, and my son asked me. He was eight years eight years old. He asked me uh, why he says this. Uh, we are in Europe, <laughs> so why should we should go to Europe? We are in Europe. <laughs> so that was that was remarkable. That um, you know that uh, the baby says the truth. So uh, that, that the major point is that we have uh, we have a kind of community which might be not very happy about the state, not, not very happy about economics, etc. But people believe that they are Ukrainians, they live in their state, and this is a established fact. We should not. Uh, we have no. Uh, <laughs> we should not spend efforts to. Uh, well. To prove it. Well, I would like to add here only that, you know, the, the, this change from the Ukraine to Ukraine is gaining the status of agency. It's uh, every sovereignty has internal and external parts, so external recognition, which was gained pretty easily in early 90s. But from within the sovereignty, the agency, uh, was growing slowly, gradually, and yes, uh, the, folk, the, the turning point was 2014-15 when uh, English language press started using expression only Ukraine without the definite article. But in order to, uh, for this to happen, there should have been a longer path gone by Ukrainian society. Well, these chapters were imagined as a short account, as I said, about this experience in certain sphere uh, for Western, uh, predominantly English speaking uh, societies or cultures. But uh, in, in the end of each chapter, we have additional, like uh, a list of the books that we recommend to read. Mm -hmm. But now the, this book is being translated into Ukrainian, and it's interesting how these additional parts are going through a change. How shall we, uh, how shall we explain to our compatriots, to Ukrainians, uh, what the books should be read? And the difference of the literature published in recent decade in the West and in Ukraine is already significant. We, we see how these parting ways between West and Ukraine was going on. So for me, it's also a learning process to see uh, the, this translation, uh, how, it, how it goes on. Uh, also, when you look in the introduction, we have a number of books written in early 90s and then in the beginning of 21st century, like the, the most important books uh, which speak to the Western communities. And for Ukrainians, I think only part of them speak. So this Ores Subtelny book, of course, it was also important for Ukrainians in the early 90s. It was a textbook for most of the universities. But then uh, the, 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 the newer books were less known, less visible. Georgi? Well, I would not. Uh, I would not claim that this volume is a comprehensive uh, history of Ukraine or concise history. It's a of course, uh, a number of topics and themes uh, were not covered, and uh, for obvious reasons, I think that every chapter deserves a uh, 
a separate book or uh, several books. So um, our idea was to present a uh, most important areas, um, which would give an impression and a certain uh, knowledge and uh, would present a narrative about the developments during the 30 years. Uh, so uh, I think it 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 is it should be a very informative reader uh, for um, for Western reader who starts to uh, familiarize him or, or herself with Ukraine. At the same time, I would uh, claim that uh, the level of presentation is a uh, at certain uh, level of academic quality. So um, people who wrote their parts, uh, their chapters are good and recognized specialists in their fields. So um, it is something between a kind of uh, relatively exhaustive volume and uh, com concise comprehensive history and uh, uh, kind of sketches which would, which would uh, just uh, give you a kind of path, orientation in the most controversial and interesting themes. So uh, definitely I myself has have an ambition to write a uh, well volume 9121 uh which would be more comprehensive in terms of uh general idea line etc but you understand that it's not a uh, not the matter of uh well one day one month one week <laughs> etc so to me, it was a very good training b before starting my own journey to the single volume of uh, Ukraine history during 30 years. So, um, and the, to, be to the best of my knowledge, well, we have a uh, we have at least uh, a dozen of uh, histories of Ukraine since uh, 91 in Ukraine in Ukrainian, but mostly they are uh, based on secondary sources and uh, they are very descriptive, and sometimes uh, they uh, contain a lot of ideological biases and uh, political biases. So uh, probably, <laughs> probably, I would recall. Uh, or Subtelny, who, uh, well, uh, about 15 years ago, when he was asked about writing a uh, contemporary history of Ukraine, he said, probably it's not time to write a contemporary history, it's better to be a cro chronicler. So mm -hmm. to write a chronicle. Uh, and, uh, well, now we're doing this, my department does it, so we have a chronicle, uh, like, uh, <laughs> like uh, medieval chronicles. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, once again, we are select we select in facts according to certain ideas, to certain uh, uh, underlying ideas. So, to sum up, uh, I would say that this uh, volume is introduction. Uh, however, it is introduction, which I believe uh, it is not uh, modest, of course, uh, to say this, but I believe which is of quite decent quality because it is written by a good specialist in their fields. Well, I think uh, when you write contemporary history, that's almost impossible to avoid. So this is why one of these hidden agendas in the book was that we have uh, in order to avoid one ideological perspective, we were inviting Western and Ukrainian scholars to come together on terms. So it was already a work on finding some common perspective between authors, which diminishes the ideological uh, judgmental uh, part of description or of analysis. But then Every chapter, if you look, uh, when you reread the book, you see that it's written from different, this judgmental or ideological perspectives anyway. So liberal, neoliberal, uh, more like national democrats. And from different perspectives, it creates also this additional value, added value uh, of this book. It provides very multi-perspective or multiple perspective on this past. For me, as a philosopher, ideology and judgment is always this bias is an object to avoid. And you cannot avoid it if you are alone. But in a dialogue or in multiple perspectives, this impact of ju uh, judgmental uh, evaluations is diminished so that 
reader can actually get information, gets analysis, and he or she would also see different perspectives quite often on the same facts. I think that it's not uh, it's not a secret uh, that uh, uh, we had some problems with some chapters, uh, exactly from the point of view of uh, interpretation. And uh, we decided not to impose our vision on uh, on interpretation. Uh, well, we trust our readers, so uh, we uh, uh, we believe that uh, our readers w would be uh, well those who uh, have a critical thinking and who are able to uh, to apply critical thinking to what they read. And uh, well, we do not claim a kind, uh, let's say, objectivity. Uh, I'm. I believe that uh, we followed so-called disciplinary objectivity when uh, people from certain discipline follow certain rules and procedures of profession, uh, which allows them to well to give to give a yes well to a certain extent proper and balanced uh, account. Uh, I would not say that uh, we were successful in avoiding certain uh, fluctuation from this uh, from the balance. It is okay. It's normal, I believe. So um, generally, yes, Misha said that uh, different chapters written from different perspectives, including uh, cert certain ideological overtones. So uh, to me, uh, well, I, I myself didn't have any any troubles with my co-author who works in the in American University. Uh, so probably I myself spent too much time in American universities, but so, but uh, generally uh, it is a well. We we and we are by 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 the way, my co-author is well originally from Ukraine, but uh, I would say that his writings on Ukraine uh, sometimes not very much welcomed in Ukraine itself by by certain segment of society. Uh, so. Um, well, I believe that majority of authors kept this principle of disciplinary objectivity and tried to give a um, balanced account. However, it was not very easy, by the way. Uh, I wrote in uh, a certain ch a certain part of this uh, book, uh, and it was about the uh, relationship between society, citizens, and the state. And uh, my own impression is that the state does not work for its citizens. In Ukraine, uh, sometimes and in in many cases, state works against their citizens, and uh, that state turned into kind of private enterprise of group of groups of interests of tycoons of uh, bureaucracy, etc. So it is real problem. It is problematic. So I cannot pre pretend that there is no problems, and I have to highlight these problems, and uh, I uh, rely on sociological data. I understand all limitations of sociological data, but I do not have any other data to uh, to present. So um, it is very complicated. Uh, Ukraine is a very complicated country. So uh, when you try to describe something which is complex, complicated, uh, which has a lot of challenges, including internal challenges, of course, it is not easy to keep this balance, and uh, you are involved. You're observer, but you're involved observer. So uh, we cannot claim <laughs> pure objectivity. We cannot claim that we are able to look at this uh, topic by the eye of God. Uh, only God is able to this, and I also have some doubts about God that uh, he or that supreme being is also able to look at this objectively because we are well believed to be uh, its create cre creatures. So um, I think that uh, well uh, we presented uh, our opinion, our point of view, which is based on contemporary level of. Uh, historiography, sociology, political science, etc., etc. And then uh, I believe that this book is a kind of uh, a part of the history of reflection, history of uh, understanding of uh, Ukraine at certain point of its development, both, uh, <laughs> both the development of uh, this uh, scholarship and development of Ukraine itself.
you know it's old discussion old story from from 95 yeah when uh, von hagen uh, published his uh, his article uh, does ukraine have a history and then this the, the whole discussion turned into the um uh well debate over the state of affairs a state of the art in ukrainian studies in north america and uh, i think that since that time something changed uh um yes uh, the institutions this all this institu institutions like canadian institute for Ukrainian studies like harvard ukrainian research institute like uh, now this uh, pro program in uh, columbia university uh inviting professors i think that uh, they were established in different times if for different purposes and uh, they were not uh, they were not designed to uh, to work with contemporary issues. Uh, they were designed either to work with diaspora, uh, like in Canada, and to promote some uh, some assistance to Ukraine studies in uh, in Ukraine after 19, 1990, or they were, uh, like Harvard Ukraine Research Institute, they were designed to work with a, to, with a, well, as academic institution. And the interest to Ukrainian studies in North America was uh, quite low, uh, which is incompatible with contemporary situation. Now there is a lot of scholars, uh, non of non-Ukrainian origin, uh, involved into this. Uh, not on, only in the U.S., also in the whole world. Uh, we have organized the International Association for Humanities uh, Congress in uh, Lviv in 2016. Yes, in 2016, and uh, there were more than 500 uh, attendees there. All uh, all people were uh, interested in Ukrainian issues from all over the world. So um, the major problem probably is that we have kind of institutional inertia with these institutions, and uh, they still uh, did not, uh, uh, let's say, uh, well, redesign themselves for... Uh, meeting contemporary issues. Uh, as far as I know, Harvard Ukraine Research Institute started a program of contemporary Ukraine. Uh, Canadian Institute of Ukraine Studies uh, wanted to start, but I don't, I have no idea if they started this because there is no information on that. So uh, they addressed the issue, but uh, they uh, started to do this very recently. Probably they will be able, with some support, uh, well, they need funding for this, uh, to develop a programs on contemporary Ukraine, uh, on study on contemporary Ukraine, not just uh, assisting or, uh, let's say, uh, bringing people from Ukraine for uh, scholarships, but uh, studying, really studying Ukraine in, in, the North, uh, in North America. Uh, yes, I, I would agree that in this uh, in this case uh, they are quite weak, and um, well, that's a matter of the future. As to students, uh, well, uh, two years ago I had a one and a half years ago I have a group of seven students in North Carolina, <laughs> in uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and uh, I would say that by the end of the term when they ran through uh, through my course on contemporary Ukraine, they would uh, have a uh, prospects to become an experts, but I don't think so. I don't think that they would be interested in going on with the Ukrainian studies in the, in the future. So uh, yes, it, it is a problem. And uh, unfortunately, uh, what uh, alarms me a lot is that Ukraine becomes a goes to the focus of interest in the West, including academia, uh, mostly due to, uh, well, something uh, disastrous things. Like uh, in 90s, when I was in the West and say I'm from Ukraine, people were saying, ah, Chernobyl. Uh, now when I, uh, in the West, they people in, speak to people and saying that I'm Ukraine, they say, ah, war and uh, war with Russia. Once in Netherlands in 2004, uh, in December 2004, when I say that I'm from Ukraine, I was told, wow, revolution. So, uh, because Orange Revolution was on the screens everywhere, on the TV screens. So, um, this is, uh, I think that it is to a certain extent also uh, one of the failures of the Ukrainian state.
to support Ukrainian studies abroad. Recently, uh, the state started to do this. For instance, Ukrainian Institute was established. And I know that, for instance, in uh, in London, uh, well, the Ukrainian Institute in London, they started very active program and they do this uh, quite actively. Uh, and uh, I hope that they will keep this line and the Ukrainian state will support presentations of Ukraine abroad, particularly in strategically important countries. So, but once again, it is the matter of the future, not not of the current situation. Well, I would say that uh, Mr. Pfeiffer is right and wrong at the same time. If you uh, look at this bench and compare it in 1990s and today, of course, this bench is much fuller. There's much more experts and scholars on Eastern, Ukra on, uh, Eastern Europe and Ukraine. However, uh, there's also true and uh, Last year, Alexander Atkin and I published, oh, we were editors, we published, um, edited and published a book on ideologies after Soviet Union. So what happened with ideological production, ideological processes in Ukraine, Russia and other countries. And one of the chapters is written by Daria Malutina, who uh, is a sociologist and she studied scholars who study Ukraine after the war started. And she actually showed how the war became the issue for uh, academy itself, Western Academy. And Western Academy is split into two uh, badly communicating camps. One is called pro-American, the other one is called pro-Russian. And of course, for policymakers, it's immediately like there's a group of uh, centers, of journals, of communities that are not seen as reliable experts. Uh, also, uh, Georgi uh, just mentioned several American centers, but in Europe, in Western and Central Europe, there's a number of new centers with very strong potential to study Ukraine and Eastern Europe. Well, I, we can name well, Basel, Greifswald, uh, Frankfurt under order, Berlin, Zoys, for example, the, the entire center. So, in a way, in Europe, you also have an entire new uh, institutional setup and at least two generations of very strong uh, scholars, older generation, younger generation, who are brilliant uh, specialists uh, and know it well. But again, from the side of policymakers, they, they always have to make a decision, do, what do they want to know? Uh, difficult truth or pleasant uh, semi-truth? Uh, I would say that uh, my, uh, my vision of Ukraine uh, was much more pessimistic be be before I have edited this book. So now it, it is much uh, better and much balanced than, than before. And for me, it was interesting uh, to see that there are already several generations of scholars and we can make a choice. So when we were uh, deciding who would be the author of that or the other chapter, there was a competition. I'm sure that 15 years ago or even 10 years ago, this wouldn't be the case. So in a way, in, in the West and in Ukraine, we have very good specialists on this various areas of Ukraine's <coughs> Well, I, I hope that, well, first of all, uh, it, the, institutionally, this project are connected to Cannon Institute and Wilson Center. And uh, I expect that this uh, respected institution would uh, develop the Ukrainian segment of its program, and uh, it will be some, some further projects. Uh, uh, well, the, the part of this uh, of this enterprise, which is a book, uh, before that we had a uh, some we had a project in uh, uh, in Ukraine together with Canon Institute, which was the project image of the other, uh, exactly about the, how Ukrainians dealing with the issue of. Um, uh, mutual cohesiveness and uh, forming of uh, a civic nation. So, uh, 
and uh, and the book is also about this. Uh, it's also about the forming the Ukrainian civic nation to a, to a great extent. Uh, well, ma majority of issues uh, in this book connected to this uh, central theme. So I believe that this book w is a part of a broader strategy. Uh, I hope that it's a part of broader strategy, which would allow us to uh, promote the Ukrainian issue uh, somewhere at very important place for Ukraine uh, in Washington DC, if we speak in political terms, and generally in academia. I, I'm mostly well interested in academic part of this project, uh, which is now, uh, well, uh, in, uh, indistinguishable from uh, from uh, also political overtones of this. So we want to, uh, uh, well, I want, <laughs> I cannot say we, uh, uh, but I, I hope that my colleagues in Canon and in Woodrow Wilson Center would share my, my understanding of this and my vision. I think that we have to promote Ukrainian studies outside Ukraine. Uh, exactly in very practical terms that our academic projects would serve to the idea of more information, of spreading information, of quality information about Ukraine, of spreading information which would allow to avoid biases and uh, decisions which would uh, not be very, not be effective or very effective at all. So. Uh, it is important project for uh, this part. The book is a part project for starting some kind of broader strategy of uh, dealing with Ukrainian issues, particularly with Ukraine, contemporary Ukraine. Because part, contemporary Ukraine already has its own history, which is 30 years which is quite enough to, to talk about history of Ukraine and about contemporary history of Ukraine of Ukraine, because many many uh, many phenomena which uh, we're dealing with already were born in Ukraine in contemporary Ukraine, and they have their own history, and this is a very important point for further development of uh, Ukrainian studies abroad, particularly in the United States and North America in general. Well, I would like to say here that uh, From the Ukraine to Ukraine, a contemporary history is the book uh, is one of the results of uh, Canon Institute Ukrainian research program. It's something that we were working for almost three years. Uh, Institute has invested into the, this project and uh, it's part of the broader idea. So Canon Institute and Ukrainian program are specifically dedicated to support the informed dialogue between American and Ukrainian uh, experts, scholars, politicians. And in a way, this book uh, provides both uh, politicians, decision makers, and a scholarly communi uh, community of uh, America with very reliable information and a, a good book. But then it kind of backlash and this book is now being translated into Ukrainian and it also is a result of this dialogue because again every chapter is written by one Western one Ukrainian scholar even if Western scholar is of Ukrainian origin it's a it's a dialogue in making and I'm very happy that uh, there was a Ukrainian company KNK group that uh, supported uh, Ukrainian translation so that, that this part of dialogue will be heard also in Ukraine. So here, that, that part is important. But yes, of course, uh, the program goes on and uh, in future we will have more uh, dedicated, specific, focused projects on contemporary art, on political issues, on energy issues. But again, uh, this book was like a fundamental step and I'm happy that it came to fruition. Uh Misha, could you uh, show the mug you have used now just to... <laughs> okay, so uh, 
Uh, this is a very good uh, uh, final for this uh, conversation, but I would say I would turn this this slogan into "Keep excited and study <laughs> Ukraine," and this is about uh, our book. Yes, I agree. I fully agree that uh, being calm but excitedly calm is very important in science as well, and I'm sure that when uh, our audience would uh, would read the book. They would also feel calmness, but also excitement. How interesting is Ukraine and how interesting is Ukrainian experience?